11 p.m. And we, from the, from our attorney's uh, bench, we have uh, Scott Broadhead, our county attorney. Thank you for being here, Scott. From our council, we have Council Thomas, Councilman uh, Hoffman, Councilman Strumberg, Councilman Hamner, Councilman Wardle. Thank you all for being here. From the county manager's office, we have Andy Welch, our county manager, Brittany Lopez, assistant county manager. From the clerk's office, it takes copious notes and records them and keeps them. Uh, Tracy Shaw, thank you for being here and leading that office. With that said, um, our first point to action is the Desert Peak Master Plan presented by Corey. Corey, you want to come forward and make sure one of those have a green light? Can I just take 30 seconds before he comes up? Sorry. Yes. Just to kind of tee it up. So you remember last year we had a master plan done on Desert Peak, and then we finalized that. You should be getting the final copy now. And so I asked Corey to come up with, and then we budgeted $5 million to start the improvements. And so I asked Corey to look at that master plan and decide what things we should start with. And so he's up here, he's here today to present kind of his idea where we should start on this. This is for your kind of your thumbs up and thumbs down to kind of give him the work program. If that's what you agree to, we can make changes if we want to, but this is what Corey recommends we start with. And so I'll let him go ahead and present. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, council. Andy, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, as Andy said, in April of last year, we uh, contracted Victus Advisors to do a feasibility study and update of the master plan of Desert Peak Complex. We presented a draft to you in December. Uh, after some discussion after that draft, we've updated a couple of things and would like to present the final plan tonight. Prior to doing that, however, we would like to update you on a few things that's going to happen at Desert Peak um, to help with that plan from the um, staff and, and um, resources that we have at Deseret Peak. We plan on um, continuing the process of cleaning up Deseret Peak by removing unnecessary and broken vinyl fence, doing a better job of weed control, uh, paint curbs so they look a little better, higher level of maintenance, and then the cleanup of old vehicles, equipment and around the shop and storage areas, as well as starting to prepare some of the venues that will be transitioned in the master plan, such as the horse barns and the racetrack and different things like that. In addition to that, we appreciate your um, willingness to fund some capital projects at Deseret Peak. These projects will all uh, be happening as well. This is not part of, it's part of the master plan, but not part of the master plan money. This is capital funds. Uh, there'll be new, a new iron uh, fence going around the pool, new pool toys and chemical controls, securing of the main line to the Energy Solutions Aquatic Center, uh, replacing air conditioning units on, on the indoor arena as well as moving the Mid-Valley Trailhead location um, because of um, some development there, okay? As I said before, um, we presented the master plan to you in December. This is the final updated version of that. It does not look very different. Uh, we added a few bathrooms to the facility as part of the recommendation and a pavilion or two. Um, on this master plan, and, and you, you'll all have copies of this. But this is what the final draft of the master plan looks like. One of the first things we need to talk about, however, is the um, maintenance and weeds facility. The weeds department needs a new place to locate, and um, the maintenance buildings for parks and recreation and facilities. Um, we believe this is the initial step in starting this master plan. This is also not coming from master plan money. This is other money. But uh, these facilities, um, as per the master plan, will be located on the property in, what is that, the northwest corner by the BMX track. There's two buildings that are there, one for the weeds, one for parks and recreation, and then a fenced yard for equipment storage for weeds, facilities, and parks and recreation. So we believe in doing this first, it unlocks other parts of the master plan that we have, we have to have these buildings to unlock those other parts, okay? This is my recommendation of where I believe the $5 million should be spent, or my recommendation as to how it should be spent um, as pertaining to the master plan. Um, and, and we'll go through each of these individually, but this is 
mostly in area one, one little portion in area, or a couple of portions in area three. And the reason we cho I chose this here is because I believe it gives us um, the most opportunity um, to invite more people to the facility with the $5 million that we have. And we can do it without causing too much uh, interruption with what the facility is currently doing and with the moving of the weeds department and the, and the storage facilities without unlocking that first. We can do this while that's going on as well. So that's why I've recommended these. First would be new walking paths around Deseret Peak. Um, this is what I believe. Um, <clears throat> there's actually a walking path that goes around the entire facility, actually zigzags through the entire facility. We could run a 5K, and if you did two laps, you could run a 10K uh, on, on the walking path that's, that, that's there. That's how big this walking path is gonna be. I believe we can get the majority of this walking that's in the red uh, done in this first phase. Um, it dresses up some of the facilities that we have that are along the curb of Deseret Peak, along the street view. Um, and I think it's, it's very important to have some passive recreation there uh, that will allow people who are swimming, softball games, soccer games, if you're there for practice, you're, you have the ability now to drop your kid off for practice and do something at Deseret Peak while they, while they practice or play. Hey, Corey, a question about on Sheep Lane, the trail that goes north towards I guess the soccer field, baseball fields there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that going to be designed eventually to have a loop rather than just have a dead end or a start point? So what you see there is, is what I believe will ha what we could fund in the first five million. There is a loop. If you look at the entire master plan, you can't see it because it's small, but it does loop the entire facility and actually goes internally in the facility as well. And so, so the... Um, I mean, the walking path, as you can, if you can't see, it goes right along Highway 112 there, past the Ochre Mountain Museum, past the Fire Museum, up towards the North Road there, all the way along the back, and back down to meet up where we are now. Internally, there's walking paths that can go past the um, swimming pool, up past the new playground area, and up into the new soccer area as well. So are those designated walking paths? They are. Or just, okay. They are designated in the master plan. Do you want to mention what the star is? Yes, uh, and I'm going to get to the, uh, oh, yes, sorry. thank you. So the star is where the new Mid Valley Trailhead location is located. We've already begun to move that trailhead location. Um, we believe that in the future, we will be able to connect the walking packs internally at Deseret Peak to the Mid Valley Trailhead. Um, and so um, I put it on the map so you understand that that's, that's part of our goal as well, is to make that connection across Sheep's Lane somehow so that um, people can get on the Mid Valley Trail in Tooele and end up at the Deseret Peak facility. Um, it would be a, it'd be a very good bike ride. How wide will the trail be? The, uh, the Mid Valley Trail? No, the ones that you're talking about. So with it. we're proposing 10 feet. Okay. Um, but that'll, it hasn't gone to design yet, but our proposal will be 10 feet. Asphalt is what we'll propose, yes. <laughs> Asphalt internally, okay? Next, um, we propose a destination playground with bathroom and pavilion facilities. So you understand a destination playground is a playground that people make preparations to go to, not just a park playground or a playground you'd find at a, at a restaurant, but a playground that has many different features, is adaptable to many different age groups and is accessible to many different levels of play. Um, I've been involved in designing and, and construction and planning of many different um, de de uh, destination playgrounds. These are some that uh, I've been involved in and this is something what, that we're looking at and would like to do as part of this master plan update. It would sit right on Highway 112. The walking path would wrap around it there would be a bathroom and a pavilion facility that could be rentable for birthday parties, family outings, uh, whatever needs to be. Uh, in the future, we, we intend to have several shaded seating areas around this facility. And so um, we're excited about that. Corey, is, uh, are these parks generally uh, pet-free parks? Uh, yes. So um, currently our policy is that dogs have to be on leash. 
So that's that's the policy we would have, and so we wouldn't we would uh, discourage pets to be involved in the playground at all, which is generally our policy. So, uh, just looking at the map, that would be where seven A is. Correct. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, our, uh, we recommend. Uh, upgrading the parking lot at the uh, softball area to uh, be able to benefit both the new playground, pavilion and bathroom, and the softball area. Currently, if we have a softball tournament, the current parking is not adequate and they have to go into the swimming pool parking. So that's 7C. They also park along the roadway as yes. well, and so th that's <clears throat> not very safe. How many more parking stalls are you looking at there for you? Uh, it hasn't been designed yet, Councilman, so I don't know, but it, it'll, it'll double. We asked them to double what's currently there. So currently there is about 110 parking stalls, so we'll go to 220. Next, we're going we're to look to upgrade the, um, oh, do some branding and wayfinding signage throughout Deseret Peak. Um, it's, it's difficult to get around Deseret Peak unless you know where you're going. We, m many times people ask us, well, I, I don't know where the pavilion is. I don't know where the fire museum is. So that's our goal is to update the branding and wayfinding signage as well. And then to update the south entrance of Deseret Peak so you don't have to drive through the parking lot to get to the west side of Deseret Peak. Uh, the Ochre Mountain Mining Museum, the Fire Museum, the motocross track, and the Ochre Mountain Mining Museum. So this entrance you see right here in the red square will provide better access when you come in. You'll have actually an option to go left or right, to the west or to the east, and it'll provide better access. The goal here is that we can hold multiple events at Deseret Peak at one time. Softball tournaments can be going on, equestrian events can be going on, Soccer tournaments can be going on when it's built out. <clears throat> Excuse me, I get a little bit of a cold. I apologize. So when you say more accessible entrance, you're just going to rebuild that entrance? We are. Okay. We are. We propose a new entrance to the convention center and indoor arena. Currently, if you hold an event in the indoor arena, it's very difficult to get to the indoor arena. Yes. Okay. There's no ticketing facility unless you come through the conference center. If you come through the conference center, it's difficult to get from the conference center to the indoor arena. So we propose a vestibule type facility on the west end of the, um, of the uh, conference center and indoor arena. That This is just a design concept I came up with that once you enter the vestibule, there'll be some ticketing facilities there and you get the choice either to go to the conference center or the indoor arena. Um, additionally, that can be expanded in the future to not only access the indoor arena or, co or conference center, but to also access the outdoor arena as well. New bleachers at the rodeo arena. We propose uh, that in this first phase we put new bleachers. This would be a pretty quick return on investment. Um, the couple events that we have that are large ticketed events at that rodeo arena sell out frequently, and this will um, help resolve some of those issues. And, yes and so get us a return on investment. Seating in, uh, capacity increase? So, it hasn't been designed yet, but we, pr we asked them to um, put about another 1,500 seats. So we'll see if they can get them there. So it's, it's really additional seating is what it is. Yeah. Then. We are, well, keep the current seating we have and add some to the west side. So, <clears throat> this, is my, this is my favorite explanation. Bleacher companies say that a person can sit in 18 inches. Crazy. Now, I haven't been able to sit there since I was in kindergarten. So <laughs> if, you, if you take their recommendation, 1,500 seat bleachers really only fit about 1,000 people. So we believe that we can fit 3,000 people in the bleachers we currently have. And if we increase that by 1,500, we're, we're adding 50% more. So as we've gone through that, that'll, that'll pretty much take up most of the $5 million. New walking paths, destination playground, pavilion and bathrooms, softball parking for the, both the playground and softball facility, branding and wayfinding signs, more accessible entrance, uh, new access and entrance to the convention center and indoor arena, and new bleachers at the rodeo arena. Did, so, uh, thank Speak you for into the mic if you don't mind, Councilman. <clears throat> thank you for bringing that up. The first half of the year will be design, and we have to get around that one big event we have in July. And once we get around that event, a country fan fest, then we, we believe we can start construction. 
but s some of those things will be were contracted to hold for Country Fan Fest, where the playground's going to go, where the walking path's going to go. They've already sold those facilities as as RV parking, so we have to hold those till after the event. Okay. But that's okay because it, it'll take us that long to design it as well to have it go through design. Any other questions? What, what you, um, are you fearful of material going up, down? What, tell me what your thoughts are on that. I talked with Victus uh, last week in preparation for this, and they said it's, it's coming. It's down about 8% from where it was when they initially did this in December. So it's down about 8%. So I'm hoping it comes down. I've actually put uh, $5,500,000 worth based on their evaluation thinking that we can get five million out of it. <laughs> so your goal is by the time of construction is down 16%. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. just well, that, that would be nice. Chair recognize nice. Councilman Wardle. So in discussion with many of the things that we discussed during the budget, yeah. your work's been awesome. Well, thank you. Seriously. <clears throat> but we don't want to kill you. Okay. So will Invictus be the one to project lead, RFPs, all of this on this, and we pay them an administration fee, or are we going to do that in-house? Now, we, we, they have engineers on staff that they could design this for us, and that would be probably the most seamless, but that's something that you would have to give permission for because that's kind of a sole source. But they have the plans, they do the drawings, they understand what we want there, and so that's something that we would need your blessing on if you would like us to, Corey. Yeah, so Victus hired Think Architects, who do many parks throughout the, throughout, the, throughout the state of Utah. They're very adept at doing this. They're the ones that actually drew the master plan, helped come up with the costs. They're the ones that drew the pictures that you see. So to be seamless, um, we could just turn it over to them, but that would require a sole source because of the amount of money. So would it be possible for you to get us just an understanding of what sole source might save us? Uh, I could, absolutely. If we and I understand that. I mean, you've had them do the master plan. This is part of why they do what they do. Right. I mean, and then they would build out, they would bid out if we use them not only on the design but on the project management side. Absolutely. They would bid out who the contractors and all those costs. That would meet our procurement policy, if I understand our policy correctly. It would. Okay. And, and mostly, councilmen, they would save us time yes. is what it would save us. Okay. So... Um, I do want to update you on a couple of things I forgot to mention when we uh, said that um, we're going to do some cleanup around. Uh, tomorrow we're holding interviews for a park maintenance supervisor at Desert Peak. Thank you for um, the allocation there. Once we have that person on board, we will hire three additional maintenance people at Desert Peak. And so uh, we're excited about the future and possibilities there. Any other questions about the master plan? And after that, I have one other thing I'd like to share with you, if you don't mind. I just have couple of things but I'll turn it over to council I don't want to council any questions Did, when you said the the trail what was the length of it a 5k so that's 3.5 miles yeah there it's it really depends on 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 the design as we go through it but it'll be about 3.3 miles 3.1 miles okay so um, for instance we could hold all the high schools cross country event there, and then they could hold their invitation with the other events up Settlement Canyon. Council Wardle, that's what I was going to say. But thanks for still on that. That's looking at you know what? Great minds think alike. It's the bald heads. <laughs> I was going to say the cross country one. That'd so, be easy yeah. to do that, and and we could hold all kinds of tournaments, international tournaments. Yeah, we could. That's awesome. All right. Any other on the master plan? I just want to update you on the trails as well. I know there was money allocated for the trails um, uh, in consultation with uh, Fred Kilpack in the manager's office, as well as uh, Rochelle from Community Development. We have come up with a few ideas where we'd like to see the $500,000 spent. The first being to pave the Mid Valley Trail so it's asphalt. It costs about $150,000 if we do it in-house with uh, our roads department, which we've been in negotiations and talking about that already, and would like to do it as, as soon as possible with your blessing. The next thing we would like to do is, one of the things that is confusing to me is, is our trail map and, and areas that we, we are responsible for when it comes to trails. We would like to develop an Ochre Mountain Trail Master Plan 
from Lake Point to Ophir. Seriously, we would. Um, and we would like to include Settlement Canyon trails. We would like to include trails up Middle Canyon as well. I talked with uh, Salt Lake County today. Uh, Salt Lake County is, is um, doing a master plan on the east bench of the uh, Wasatch Mountains. It's gonna cost them about $150,000. I think we can do it a little cheaper than that. Um, but in that conversation with their head planner at Salt Lake County, he mentioned to me that they would like to do phase two of the Butterfield Canyon hiking and biking trail and connect into Middle Canyon. That puts a little onus on us to connect to something. Now, in that conversation, we've had conversations with Kennecott, and currently Kennecott is very amenable. They've been very good to work with on the Salt Lake County side. I've been in contact with a couple of people at Kennecott, and they're currently, their CEO is currently very amenable to allowing access on their land for trails. So that's why we would like to put a plan in place so that the plan is in place, everybody understands the plan, and then we can move forward with that as well. Some of the other things we've, one other one we thought we'd look at is the road uh, that goes on the north side of Tula Army Depot that would connect the Mormon Trail Loop to the Mid Valley Trail. So in essence, you could start at the Mid, uh, Mormon Trail Loop and end up in Ophir if you wanted to, on a trail. So that would, that would, because once you get to Mid Valley Trail, you could be in Tooele and I have to maybe do a little street access down to Stockton, but once you get to Stockton, you know, you're, you're ready to go. So that's our proposal with the $500,000 we've set aside for this year. Um, and um, we think that's, we think moving forward with a plan for the, for the uh, Ochre Mountains trail wise would be, would be the best, one of the best uses for that money. Question about the last trail you the connected from 12 Valley to clear out to Stockton. How much motorized, how much bicycle and pedestrian? Well, that, again, that trail would have to be uh, developed. We would anticipate, the issue is Mid Valley Trail is non-motorized. So we would anticipate that from the Mormon Loop to the Mid Valley Trail would be accessible for all four disciplines, hiking, biking, ATV and equestrian. Um, but the issue is Mid Valley Trail. Um, well, currently it's not accessible to ATV. But if you want to ride your mountain bike from the Mormon Trail up to the mountains of Ophir, it would be a nice ride. Is there any um, criteria with electric bikes? So our current policy with electric bikes is class one electric bikes are considered, and this is based on the US Forest Service recommendation. Class one bikes are, cons are accessible, uh, can be accessible on hiking trails. So a class one e-bike means you have to pedal to get the motor going. A class three, they go class one, class two, class three. A class three basically is a motorcycle with pedals. So, so, cur so currently a class one, yes, you have to do some work to get the motor going so that then if you wanted to rest, you could rest for a short distance. What about ATVs and UTVs and things like that for some of these trails? Is there plans? Absolutely, and that would be part of the master plan with Ochre Mountain. We would designate all kinds of trails for all kinds of disciplines. Okay, would there be in interconnectivity in all of those areas, that, or that's is, our, that, is that the hope and the idea? Is that where yes, you're going with this? Yes, that's corridor? our plan. We would like to have interconnectivity for all four disciplines across the Ochre Mountains. So, just so I could plead my case. Yes. Class twos are great. Okay. <laughs> and, and there's a there's this federal standard on class two electric bikes that they have to be under a certain amount of uh, speed regulation versus, of course, you can take governors off like Colin has on his. <laughs> that makes it a motorcycle. But some of us, I, I think that we do need to look at that because it is a huge part of the ecotourism now, especially on our walking and biking trails um, where it's intended not to use be used as a motorized vehicle but an assistance vehicle. And I'm happy to that. Yeah. Currently, we've. I'm happy to look at that. Yeah. Currently, we've just adopted what the Forest Service yeah. is as, yeah. as we move through. But I, I, I would changing. love to look at that just because one of my concerns and one of the things that sh it's the paradox of what we're talking about, actually. And that is, as we develop this, we don't want Salt Lake to know, but Salt Lake will know. Yeah. That's our paradox. We want them to know, but we don't. Mm -hmm. I understand. Because it will create 
we, we will become a branded area for ecotourism, which is what we want. <laughs> but we've got to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place correctly to handle that. And so. again, not to go back on the master plan, but we, we think the master plan helps us with that infrastructure. Additionally, all three of these things are on the active transportation master plan that is out, five, or out 50 years, 20, 30, 40, and 50 years. And so all these, you know, we, we looked at the active transportation master plan, all these support that. So WFRC mm -hmm. has some trail planning money. We also might want to look at what they have. Okay. And the governor's office just uh, six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, put into place interconnectivities of trails between Salt Lake County and all the counties. <laughs> they may throw money. So those are two funding sources we also can look at. Okay, we can do that. Any other questions, Council? Very good job. Thank you. Really good job, Corey, but I have one question. With all the connectivity of the trails, do you have any notion of what the length of that is? Is it 10 miles, 100 miles? Oh. Our biggest strength is our biggest weakness in that we have a lot of trails, but a lot of them are social. And so the master, the idea of the master plan is to identify trails that can be marked and signed and maintained. And we do have money in the budget to, to do more signage now. Yes, we so do. We're, we're starting that. So, but yeah, we I, need to get the I, master plan. I don't. I, I know on the prospector trail in our in our uh, marketing uh, paraphernalia, we see there's over 700 miles in prospector alone. That doesn't include the Ochre Mountains. So. I would anticipate we'll be in the two to 300 mile. Okay. And also we got the new high desert trail. Yeah, we haven't talked about that, but. That's a little longer than a couple hundred miles. It's 1,200, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. That'll bring us down to resolutions and ordinances. Uh, corrected version of the resolution 2022-51, adopting the 2023 budget and chair recognizes uh, Alice McCoy. All right, Council, this is purely um, overkill and for transparency purposes and um, just because, like Scott said, I like 100%. So um, the budget that I put before the Council um, had all the numbers on there, but we have um, what we like to call a plug number in the appropriation from the fund balance, and there was a column of numbers that did not calculate in the revenue column um, to the tune of $307,100. And so you saw all the numbers, but you didn't see the correct calculation for um, the appropriation for the, for the fund balance, which actually decreased. So um, we are asking you to readopt the budget, but it's actually better than what you saw before. So, um, so that everything is correct and then transparent on that. Yes, exactly. So that's why I'm here. Um, we don't technically have to, but um, after talking with the state auditor's office and um, just a gut feeling it felt better to bring it back to you so council any questions move report yes okay thank you and i also should say and a conversation with the attorney's office it felt better <laughs> congratulations on getting the a authorizing the council chair to sign interlocal cooperation agreement lake point colin winchester we have for uh, several weeks been negotiating with lake point on an interlocal agreement, you should have that before you. They have already approved it, they've approved their resolution, and they've actually signed the agreement. It basically says we'll give them $360,000 of sales tax money that they would receive from January through June of 2023. Uh, sometime in about September, we'll go back and get the actual numbers of sales tax money and we'll adjust that up or down to make sure that it comes out correct. We'll also provide them roads maintenance and uh, upkeep and so forth by them giving us their Class C road funds. We'll do that for the stated period of time, which is through the end of this year, through December of 2023. Solid waste, they'll stay on the system. Um, continue to bill the customers directly at $48 for the first can, I think it is, and there's a slight upcharge for the second can. Uh, land use inspections and approvals, a big part of the agreement is a 
six page table that you'll see hooked onto the agreement. These are land use applications that were pending at the time that Lake Point became a city. We have already collected the application fees for those and so we'll continue to do those. And they outline each and every one of those, including the ones that Rochelle was concerned about having an adverse effect from the moratorium. Those are on this table and are exempt from the moratorium. Law enforcement will provide to them through the end of the year. Uh, there's a, a charge for the first six months that includes dispatch. They will then re be required to enter their own dispatch agreement that will take them for the next six months. And those amounts are set forth in there as well. It's about $130,000 for the first six months, which includes dispatch. And after that, it's 60,000 give or take per quarter for the other two quarters of the year. Um, I believe that's the gist of it. There are 30-day um, out clauses for each of those services if they decide or if we decide sometime during the year to get out, give notice, 30 days notice, and we can get out of particular ones or the whole thing okay. if necessary. Chair recognized Councilman Wardle. The 30-day out notice is one that does concern me because it terminates at the end of our budget year. I'm wondering if we want 90 days notice on getting out for the simple reason of budget that if this terminates on December 31st at the end of this year, uh, 30 days notice on what that impact will be to our solid waste fund and possible increases in other areas that we would have to make. That's why I'm wondering if, 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 they don't, if we don't move forward with the contract, we need notice. And we've had that discussion with the Lake Point City Council, particularly regarding the roads. They would like to keep the 30-day notice in there, but they have agreed that they will give us much more notice than that if they intend to get out on any of these. They've been very good to work with, and I accept their word at that. We particularly talked about we need to do budgets in July, August, September, October. We needed more time, and they said, look, we're going to know well in advance, and we will give you, even though we're only required to give you 30 days notice, we'll give you much more notice than 30 days. Okay. That's all. Any other questions, Council? Move forward. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Colin, stay right there because you're going to talk about the mending section 1 2 7 council meetings. As we discussed brief briefly when you established your council meetings for the year, the dates of those council meetings, our current ordinance requires us to do that by ordinance. Uh, it turns out we rarely establish them by ordinance. We, in fact, the, uh, the covered ordinance for this one says that historically that's not been the way it's been done. Kylie and I did discover that it was done in 1990, and since 1990, I don't think we've done it by ordinance since, so that's only 32 years of noncompliance. The proposal is to take out the by ordinance rule and simply say that council meetings shall, or the council shall meet in regular session at stated times. That schedule you already approved for this year in your last meeting. Any questions or concern, Council? Am I okay to say move it forward? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for catching sure. that. Um, and that brings up the rezone. Trish? Hello, Council. Um, Trish Duclo, planning staff. Um, just a quick overview on this. So um, Mike Drury is our applicant, and I don't see him. I don't know if he's online or anything. I don't know if you need to speak to him or not, but I didn't see him here. Brittany is online. Yeah, oh. you can't see. It's just, so I don't I know, know if he's he just attending or, or what. listening or not. But. Say thank you. Um, so the intent of this project and this request is that um, he... Ultimately, the applicant wants to subdivide this property and sell off those pieces, but he can't currently do that with our zoning code requirements for minimum acreage. Um, right now, that property is zoned to MU40, which is a 40-acre minimum, um, and so if he was to even split that in half, his 68 acres doesn't meet that 40-acre minimum. So he wants to rezone the portion of it that he would eventually subdivide into, so we took that legal description, and I did send that updated legal to you guys this afternoon. I don't know if you got a chance to look over that, but I did make sure that Jerry Houghton, um, our surveyor, looked over that and made sure it was good so that we could adopt that into the ordinance um, when we write, rewrite the rezone um, portion of it. 
Um, so he wants to rezone just that portion, if you can see the, the map or anything on it, um, to A20. Um, and he, we did have a couple of applicants reach out to us, as well as um, the owner, Mike Drury, um, for a cannabis facility. Um, I think a portion of it, most of it will be inside. Um, there might be a few acres outside. Um, and then the other, the other applicant with the remaining portion of the property, the larger area, which will remain MU40, um, they wish to do uh, it's Utah track and welling, um, just like a heavy equipment storage facility for all of their equipment that they do. Um, uh, yeah, is there anything, any other questions? Is it legal marijuana? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so as far as I understand it, this company that wants to come in, they have a large facility out. Um, uh, I want to say it's like Eagle <coughs> Mountain area out there. Um, and so with the state, as far as I understand it, they can only have so much rights. And so they did gobble up a portion of their rights with Eagle Mountain, so they would only put a smaller facility out in the county, but they do want to put one out here. And we did just adopt the ordinance for the cannabis facilities. So a so, couple of questions, just so we can have them on the record. Yes. What is the difference between businesses that can be placed on an A20 and an MU40? Um... There's there's a few differences. I don't know right off the top of my head. I'd have to look at all of our, compare it to our zoning tables. Um, but there are some that would require like a CUP okay. compared to a permitted. Um, and, and they're quite similar, to be honest. Um, but because of the, the cannabis facility that wants to come in, we did just adopt that to only allow an agriculture. So that's why he wants to do the Ag 20 instead so of something else. Great job. That's the one thing I wanted okay. to go on the record. The second thing is um, he can't build houses on this, correct? Um, he could. Um, with those zones, ME40 and NA, they could build homes in it. But not like what he was proposing. Before. No, no. But before he wanted to do like RR1s, um, which is a rural residential one acre minimum. So he would, he, before that, he had wanted to put like 20 homes or something in this portion of it rezone that portion so okay do how close would this be to any other homes um if you look just to the it'd be like the northeast corner those two portions there um those are and right across the street there are currently i think three or four homes right across the street and to the to the east of those um they are larger properties though still um, there is a, a zoo, a petting zoo, um, right next to that, which is it's bordering essentially both sides of that property. Um, the only thing I worry about, I guess, long term is the smell of the marijuana. Um, yeah, so with... What, what they're doing to mitigate that. My, my daughter works up at Utah State, and she works in one of the marijuana research things, and she comes out of there smelling like marijuana. In fact, she has to carry a thing saying with her that she works at the research plant in case she ever gets pulled over by a cop or whatever, so... Kind of she funny. always happy? <laughs> <laughs> she's a good kid. Always See? has been. But she's not that kind of kid. So in so our I'm just our, working because it does put off a... Correct. Yeah, in our, in our ordinance, uh, we did require those facilities to be so far away from other homes, um, hoping that that, that distance was going to be enough to not cause a nuisance to them. And I'm sure um, those cannabis facilities do have their own regulations to make sure that those aren't going to, to be a nuisance to those neighboring properties. Yeah, we, so. we have one in Twilla City, and you can't tell. Yeah. So, not that I've tried. <laughs> so. True, John. When I was in the attendance to the meeting with the last planning and zoning when it's come to the planning and zoning commission. I'm kind of concerned about the roads. And when he first come in the very first time, I had those same concerns about it. Oh, yeah. So I did put those conditions. Um, I for, thanks for mentioning that. I did add those conditions. Um, so the, the public was really concerned, especially those living down that street. And um, it is kind of a, it's a failing infrastructure, essentially. And it's hard to maintain. And so 
I did put those um, conditions with this zone, uh, zoning approval um, that the applicant or um, future developments that come in do a very detailed traffic study with the conditions of where the roads are at now and how that's going to impact the roads that are now. Because he did provide a, a traffic study, but it wasn't all, all that traffic study did was say this was a class. Um, I think it's like a class B, class B road. And so they just looked at that and what, and they didn't even look at um, the developments that could have come in. They just said that this road can handle so many cars. Um, they didn't look at the current infrastructure of the road and they didn't account for what those developments coming in. So um, my suggestion was to put a, a, a condition on this zoning was that they, they do a detailed, um, traffic study that would account for what businesses are coming in and what the roads are currently, um, how that would impact the current standards of it right now. So how, how do we verify their study? Because if, if I'm going out and say, hey, I want, I want, I need to get this study done so I can sell this property, who verifies their work? Because I'm buying that study. Right, so it would it would have to be a traffic engineer that would essentially um, tell us what that would involve, um, and so f we would. I, I'm I'm not sure if um, our engineers can tell us that as well, but um, we would have to have those engineers uh, define those to us. And then also, uh, Mr. Drury said that uh, that we not Wheeler that the heavy repair of industrial equipment, a lot of dirt moving kind of equipment was coming in. And he also said the cannabis was coming in. How do we know they're coming? Um, they've reached out to me personally, both these applicants. And so they're very interested on, and they've been really involved in each of these steps. It's, I mean, everybody can pull out for any reason, right? They, there's not like a really contract agreement, but they did reach out to, to me and the planning staff that this is, what they want to move forward with after these um, processes have been in place. So he'll have to rezone and subdivide, and then they've been really involved in all of this process. If that heavy, I wouldn't want that, I wouldn't want a lot heavy equipment place to repair a shop um, in my neighborhood, especially down a, a, that kind of a setting. I, I would not. So I don't know if we protected the neighborhood if we approve that. Does that come under the conditional use so when they, when that company comes in? How do we protect the neighborhood? Yeah, so it, it would fall into a conditional use permit, which is required to go to planning commission. Um, and so the applicant knows that as well, and they know that there would be a lot of conditions placed on there because of those residential areas uh, with the homes in place. Um, but the MU40 does essentially allow it. Um, and if you look at our general plan mapping, um, this area is defined as general manufacturing. So they, that's what they attended this area to be, even though there's a lot of ag uses currently in it. So um, I don't have the map on there, but if you pull up the general plan, most of that north area of Burmester is general manufacturing. And if you go a little bit further south, so there's a border between Grantsville City, it's, it's ag, and then it'll be Grantsville City. Um, so I, with the general plan and with the current zone, that's what we allow by code. Council, any other questions? I have one, but I, I don't want to pollute the pool. When you say that you'd like to require that extensive um, traffic study, mm -hmm. is that something we'd have to make in a motion, or is it in the application? Oh uh, no, you'd have to make that within your motion. Um, it is in the planning staff recommendations. Is that and then and then there's another stipulation because it is in a FEMA zone. Um, that they get those FEMA permits and established before they do any kind of development in there. Um, <clears throat> it's not like, it's not in place yet, um, the studies and stuff, but if you look at the FEMA areas, it's in a, an alluvia fan, an, an alluvia, alluvia fan, so I <laughs> excuse me. But so, I'm, and the, the property owners did express no, concern with that area of flooding no. because in certain areas, um, certain areas of that, um, and at different times of the year, that that property does flood with water. So I guess yeah, to follow up on that, to make a motion 
how would you word that, Colin? Yeah. Hey, they do extensive uh, traffic study for this. Maybe you're going to answer that. Actually, no, what I'm going to do is alleviate the question for a minute. And that is, this is not on for a vote tonight. It's in two weeks. And so I would recommend you get us language and you get us what you want as uh, conditions. Yeah, because that, that's puzzling. And then send that me. to us so that we can have that for our next meeting. But you had a comment, Colin. At the risk of agreeing with Councilman Wardle, <laughs> Trish did put those criteria into her staff report and recommended them to the Planning Commission, but they passed the recommendation to rezone without those conditions. So yes, if you want the conditions, we have to put them back in. Okay. So my That's what I need to know on that. So Sorry. some of our, if you could, and I know this is double work, please forgive me, okay? But in the document presentation for our next meeting, if we can have what the Planning Commission recommended and what the staff report recommended, so that can be a matter of public record that can be seen prior. So Mr. Dreary mm -hmm. knows exactly what we will be looking at. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Uh, Chair, recognize Councilman Thomas. Has the neighbors been notified of this? I mean, I don't see one of the families. Here yeah, they um, quite a few of them showed up to our planning commission meeting. Um, and so they knew then that it was um, unanimous in favor of um, at that meeting and that it would go to the council. So they were notified and they did show up to the first public meeting. Okay. Thank you, Trish. Yes. Appreciate you. Uh, Just clarify, so you want to put this on the first meeting in February, correct? Yes, okay. what, what, is that? Move it on to the first meeting in February, is that? Yep. Okay. And then, Mr. Chairman, item C, also we don't have on the agenda tonight, and we said we're ready to move that forward for uh, four C. It is not on the agenda for tonight. The, ca the calendar, right, that's for the 7th. Yeah, so we need to make sure that all the council knows we won't be voting on that tonight. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Wardle. It brings us up to road shops, lot operation study. Jed? Good evening, council. Thanks for uh, having me. Um, this is the RFP that was put out for the road uh, site study um, to help us with planning for the future of the site. It also uh, was in the RFP to include the architectural design for the new offices that are within the building that was recently built last year. Um, I worked with the auditor's office. We put it out uh, to bid at state on the state procurement website as an RFP last December and uh, didn't receive any responses. So I seeked uh, three quotes from PEPG Babcock and Enzyme Engineering, and Enzyme provided us with the lowest quote. Um, it came in under what the estimated budget was, and this is just to approve the, to award the RFP. The contract will be coming at a later date, and then following that, the architectural contract which we budgeted 1.5 million to do that work will be coming after that. So okay. this is step one of three, potentially three. So this is proving uh, the RFP. RFP to, to award to Enzyme Engineering as the lowest bidder to proceed with the site study and the architectural design. And once we get that out to bid, I will bring that back after we determine who lowest bidder is and what the design is and all that stuff. Okay. And the utilities to the building as well. And you're putting in there everything that you want them to look at. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Is there any other comments, council? Move forward. Okay. Thank you. Jen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Folder inserts. <coughs> Wayne. Good evening, Council. Uh, this folder inserter will alleviate some of the issues that the staff has when they are sending out the quarterly billing. It will stuff a little over 8,000 envelopes. The fourth quarter of this year, they had to do that all by hand, and uh, 
it took them just a little bit of time to get that done. There's other capabilities of this machine with e-billing, and if we can get some people to opt into that, uh, that will help as well. And it will recognize anybody that has more than one property that they service with CANS, it will stuff all of their uh, invoices into one envelope and send them out that way as well. Uh, it, is, it is on the state contract, and it was budgeted for during the process last year. And it meets within that budget? Yes. Any other questions, Council? I think uh, anything you can do to save time and efforts on employee side. Okay. Working hard. Thanks. Okay, this is uh, number seven. This is what was, uh, this is not on our business. Is that what you were saying, Councilman? Okay. Adam, this is on our work meeting. It, it, yeah, it is on the business meeting as well. Should be. Oh, okay. So uh, you guys have the packet. I have a printout if you would like one, if, unless if you have it in front of you, that's great. If not, I can hand you the printout. No, printout. I'd like one. Thank you. Oh, okay. Nova Times is our time and attendance system that we use. Uh, we've used it for about five years, four and a half years at this point. Uh, it's ready to, our, the current contract we're under is ready to expire at the end of January, and so we need to renew it. Um, so the third or fourth page in there is the, the contract to renew for a three year term. Uh, and it locks in our price uh, for three years. A uh, couple things to know. Uh, this morning, uh, there was concern from auditor's office, uh, Allison. Uh, we're implementing Tyler, and there's a little bit of a concern with a couple of the modules that they uh, are uh, implementing for contract, or not contracts, grants, tracking grants, uh, and, and those kinds of things, that there could be some compatibility issues, or, or potentially. I've reached out to Jamie Blundell, who's the contact. He's the salesperson that we work with through NovaTime. And he's willing to write in a one year, or sorry, to, to write in an out clause that if there's compatibility issues, that we would be able to get out of the contract so we're not locked into something for three years. Uh, he said he was going to send that verbiage. Um, I don't have that uh, currently. Um, I do have an email from him where he says that he's willing to to write up a proposal. Um, I've talked with Colin, and he said that's probably not quite good enough as far as a, from a contract perspective. But uh, I, I feel like we should renew it, but uh, if there's some hesitancy with uh, the, the current setup with it being three years and not having an out clause, uh, that may be kind of difficult, especially if we get locked into something that's not compatible. One last thing I'll say is he, uh, talking to him on the phone, uh, majority of their clients do use the Tyler system, and he has no concern that there would be any compatibility or uh, any issues that way. He's fully confident. So writing that into a, a contract with an out clause, he didn't have any concern with that at all. So. Uh, we need to decide if we want to move forward and give uh, some permission with a rewritten contract or if we need to bring it back. Um, if we bring it back, I asked him if, we, uh, if he would be willing to grant an extension because our current contract ends January 31st. He didn't fully say he would, but he did say if, you, if we're not willing to move forward and we need to talk about it again during the February 7th meeting to let him know and he would uh, consider an extension at that point. So. We need to decide what we want to do and how to move forward or, or to put it on hold until the next one. Council, any questions or comments? I, it's not a comment. Oh, yeah, can I, Chair, recognize Andy Welch. Thank you. I get, the one thing that we could do is waiting on, we're still waiting on the, the verbiage for calling the review, but you could recommend approval based on Coleman's review of the verbiage, and then if that's okay, we can sign it, but we, it's kind of time sensitive right now, and so that's one way to get around this, is just to say that we'll approve it pending 
Collins' approval Collins of the review. language of the out clause. Okay. I think Collins, is that, would that be? For fear of trying to agree with Colin. Twice. <laughs> Um, is this the first renewal of this contract? Or is it yes, second? it is. Yep. I, just in the future, I have a really hard time renewing a contract with the supplier. We do this with our auditors. We do it with everyone else. That if it's gone over five or six years, we need to bid it out again to make sure that that's the group we want to go with. And I, I think that's an important principle. Now, I know that these are going to run for a while, but the, the extension clauses matter because we don't know after six years if that's the best deal if we haven't checked that it's the best deal, even with switchover in technology. Keeps the answer principle we need to be And keeps them honest, yep. So are you saying we should take it out No, I'm bid? saying no, just that for if, you, if it comes back in the future, in three years, I think that, that okay. everyone needs to be aware that we need to make sure we're checking because it, I, I, the state auditor's recommendations on certain things have been that we need to look at contracts, especially where we, when we're six or eight years and with the same vendor. I think that that's a concern, so. Okay, thank you. Council, uh, Chair, recognize Council Thomas. I like the recommendation that uh, Andy's put forward and that I think we, I could support that. Of saying that on approval when they get the wording right, Colin blesses it then we have Andy or you sign whoever does the contract signing. I'm okay with that. Okay. Any other comments? Thank you, Adam. Well, what if they don't get the the language? I guess there call is them. more. Do we have a contingency that because I'm going to have a hard time agreeing on a contract that Colin yeah. you don't agree on yeah. language on that we don't have <laughs> yet. So what is the contingency if the contract ceases on February first? I have verbal confirmation that he's willing to put that in. I'm, I don't have a concern that that will fall through. Okay, I just want to so. make sure that we are clear that... Yeah. yeah. No, and, and it, it cannot... Well, we would go without a contract. And so, you know, he told me if, if we don't get a, a three-year contract, we're just eligible for whatever pay or, or fee increases come our way, we wouldn't be locked into this rate for that three-year term. So the three-year so, contract locks us in at a rate as opposed yes. to the annual raises that they'll typically charge if we do one year by year. So right. It so it would be a year-to-year -year thing, yeah. but then we still have additional a So you, we're, we have a contingency. Correct. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. I see your point. So are we moving forward that direction? Thank you, Adam. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Brings us down to discussion items. It's a contract interlocal agreement with uh, cities presented by Ty, Councilman Ty Hoffman. Um, Ty, can you speak into your mic? Yes. So this came up because of the discussion we had back in October in regards to services for IRDA. And um, Scott was pretty adamant that eventually we need to have a policy in regards to this. And so I sent something over to Colin and he made it significantly better as far as some recommendations as far as what they ought to look like. And in doing that, I talked to Jed Bell and I talked to um, the Sheriff's Department of what things ought to look like. And so this is just kind of the starting point of this discussion to create this policy as far as what we want this to look like. This does not even touch on some of the things that will be coming up on the, in the future didn't touch on waste at this point, didn't touch on um, courts or anything like that. And so I expect this will um, evolve to include those in the future as things in, um, continue to happen and more cities incorporate and things like that. So this is just the starting point of that based on that discussion back in January. So. We can move it forward for, I, I don't think we're ready to, to discuss it now. I mean, to, to vote on it obviously tonight, but I think we need to start having this discussion on what, what else you guys want in there, get those things to call in, things like that, okay? And that's really about all I wanted to mention. So, and then we, with the expectation that down the road, this is gonna um, expand with district courts and other, other things like that, okay? Okay. Any other I, know, I know Scott had one recommendation 
that he, in regards to the police or something like that? I don't know if you want to touch on that now or? No, let, I don't think, I think, you know, we, we had a formula that Allison came up with. We talked, that was emailed out. I think that needs to be included. I think we're at the beginning of a policy discussion, not in, so. Correct. I think we get ideas and then we banner them around and see where it rests, so. And Chair recognizes Councilman Thomas. I don't know why we need to have a policy. This is called a contract. We started out with ERTA. We fine-tuned it for Lake Point. Uh, the next one that might in, that we have to have this agreement or to be able to use this policy would be Stansbury. I think we've already got uh, pretty much the bugs worked out. We might have to tweak it up per city, uniqueness to that situation. But to write a policy and a procedure for everything, to me, it's, well, it's a waste of time. And so based upon that, Colin, we're, we've got a great agreement with Lake Point, a good one with Erda. Uh, I think we're spinning our wheels on things that are not important prior to prioritization. So. Okay. Any other comments? Thanks, so are, Ty, for your... So are we, is this a discussion we want to have? We have an objection now. Is this one we want to continue with so we don't spin our wheels or... Do we want to continue with the discussion? Oh, we, we're still having that discussion. That's your comment, that, right? I don't see taking, uh, I'm gonna pick on Colin. He didn't have anything to do. Then I think it goes on the back of his burner to do list. He could pri prioritize his workload. To me, I don't see this as being a, what are we doing it for? The what, how, and why? Why are we doing this? I, it doesn't meet the bar. Mm -hmm. Councilman Hoffman, do you well, want to like respond? I said, to the that? reason why I, I address this is because Scott wanted to see a policy, and so Scott, maybe you can address the why better than I can. I will address it because a council can be arbitrary and capricious in how they assess fees, and where we have had inconsistency as we've looked at contracts in the past and why we have done things. I believe we need to show consistency that if someone incorporates, they know what their costs are going to be. So. If Stockton, for instance, would like to get rid of their police department and they say that the county's going to take it over, they should know what their costs are going to be instead of going, well, maybe we'll charge this or maybe we'll charge this. We have fee structures for everything else. And so and my other thing is in three years from now, if somebody were to come back and say changes, this council is going to change. No, we have an we election have, in two years. It, it's going to change and we can't pass that the future lab, the board, council, are not bound to previous agreement. No, but they could amend it then, but... But we can amend it then, but things change, and, and when they go into a contract, and we're gonna contact uh, Sheriff Wimmer and, and other people that are doing it, is it nice to have? Yeah, maybe. Well, but to me, it's not worth the time of taking time's valuable to our staff. Let, let, let me help you understand why. When we did the fire agreement with Stockton, there were provisions that we talked about of what a fire station would cost. Well, now we're debating that as a council instead of putting in costs. If I'm looking at ERTA's agreement, ERTA's agreement may have undervalued what the cost for services were going with the county. Citizens who have the opportunity to vote to incorporate should have an opportunity to understand true costs instead of someone on the fly or sort of making up numbers that would work. That is the critical part. And those are the arguments that have been consistently made during incorporations and post incorporation. And so they have to come to the people that can provide those, the cost. Which is us, which, which is, is us. what we would put in the policy. And what we put in, we do that and we got it under the contract. No, it, the contract is based upon the policy, not the contract the policies, driving the policy. We don't have a policy now, so we have a contract. That, yeah, that's what we're, we're doing. We're involved in it. So uh, that's my thoughts. If we, the, the council wants to move forward, it's just, to me, it's a, a, so, not, a, it's not a waste of time. So my question, the t question that was asked to me by Ty is why would we do this? We would do this so that municipalities can know, or future municipalities, what the cost of services from Tooele County are, instead of saying, well, we did this for Lake Point, but we're not going to do it for Stansbury, because that could happen. Or we did this for Rush Valley, we 
notice that, and we're not doing it the same way for Erta City. Those are the things. It gives us consistency and planning for those who may want this service. Okay, one last comment is, so those services that any future or city is going to need are the same ones that Lake Point, Stansbury, or Erta has asked for. No. That's when you come back to the county manager, to the council at that time and say, we're thinking about, and we've already had that discussion with some of the people from Stansbury, so things will change each time, and even you cannot write a policy to capture everything that will be looked at. I disagree with you, but... So. Any other comments? Council? Okay, so there's something to... Go ahead. Did yeah. you have a comment? No, I think we just continue to work on it and move forward. Yeah, I think, they're, so, I think we're going to get the language together. We're going to go back and forth and see um, how that policy is going to be. Okay. With that said, uh, that's not a voting item right now. And uh, council, if you'll indulge me, I don't think we have enough time to go into a closed session for the different things that need to be discussed. We have eight minutes. Um, is it okay if I look for a motion to... A, uh, recess for eight or adjourn for eight minutes. Give us a chance to go uh, do various uh, activities and then meet back here at seven o'clock. Okay. For so moved. Is there a second? Second. We're adjourned. We're adjourned.